Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Gospels record at least seven instances of Jesus giving sight to the blind. This miracle of God and the sign of the Messianic age that many Old Testament texts point to are obviously fulfilled in the person of Jesus, including our gospel reading for today. It's kind of interesting that chapter 9 of John's gospel is the only account in John's gospel of Jesus giving sight to the blind. It's a sign that declares Jesus to be the Messiah, the promised one of old who came from God into this world of darkness and sin in order to be, as he says in our text, the light of the world. I think this gift of sight in our gospel today comes to us with four distinct features or characteristics. First of all, the man was blind from birth. Think about that. He had never seen physically a day in his life. His parents and his friends attested to that. The second thing is that the disciples offered a couple of law-based reasons for that blindness. They wondered if this was the result of that man's sin, or if not his sin, then his parents' sin. And before we point the finger at them for their own blindness, I have to add that was the common teaching of the rabbis of that day. The third characteristic that I think is so unique is that Jesus uses spit and mud to restore the blind man's sight. He didn't just say, receive your sight, but he was hands-on. He applied this clay or mud to the man's eyes. And the fourth thing is that Jesus told the man to go wash in this pool with a funny name, Siloam, which means sent, as when one sends someone on a trip. So now let's take a look at those four insights, if you will, those four characteristics of this reading as they relate to us. First of all, that this man was blind from birth. He had never seen a day in his life. The spiritual truth for all of us is that we are spiritually blind, not only from birth, but let's back that up to our conception. At the very moment of conception, David says, we are a sinful human being, blind spiritually, if you will, and needing this sight restored by the only one who can restore sight. This original state goes all the way back to what we call our first parents in paradise, Adam and Eve. We have inherited this blindness. And the proof of that blindness is manifest in so many ways. Who among us hasn't questioned God and his ways and his timing? Oh God, why? Oh God, why me? Why does God allow someone to be born blind in the first place? Or why does God allow someone to be born sighted and then have that sight taken away from them later in life? These are hard questions. And the hard part for us is that we don't always get the easy answers we're looking for but that we ask them in the first place and that we're frustrated that we don't get the answers we want is a symptom in and of itself of our own spiritual blindness. Now let's take a look at that second insight, the two law-based reasons for this man's blindness. I want to point out that Jesus rejects both suggestions and he says that this blindness is not because of this man's sin. It's not that God zapped him because of his parents' sin. 
But these are opportunities for the gospel to shine forth. Opportunities for God's work to be done in this man's life while it is still day. And Jesus then gave kind of a a partial answer to evil and hardship and all those questions that we ask. He says, neither this man or his parents sin, but that happened. And by the way, he wasn't saying they weren't sinners. He was saying that wasn't the cause of this man's blindness. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. And I think it is incumbent upon each and every one of us to take the trials and the ills of our life and view them through that lens. It kind of puts all our crises into a bit of perspective. We look at everything that happens, including the hard times and what we would term as the bad things, through the view of the cross because the shadow of the cross is always landing upon us and everything that happens to us. And that's important for us to know that because Jesus died for every one of our sins. And that also reminds us that when we as Christians face these times of trial and hardship and heartache, it is not a punishment for sin. Jesus took that punishment for us. We deserve the punishment for sin, but Jesus took it for us. That's why he died on the cross for us. Now, that's not to say that we don't face certain consequences in our lives for willful sin, but it helps us put all of life in this kind of a context that God works all things together for good for those that love God, that the work of God might be displayed in his and in your life. At one of the congregations I served, I had the privilege of being the pastor of a young woman who had been born blind. She'd never seen a day in her life. As a matter of fact, her eyes were even replaced with prostheses. She was very actively involved in the congregation in just about every aspect of the congregation. She even played in the bell choir. She attended every worship service. She came to Bible classes, even Life Light Bible class in which we obtained Braille resources for her. And so one Sunday, we were privileged to have a speaker come and talk to our church. This special guest speaker was the Reverend Dave Andrus, who at that time was the mission facilitator for New Blind Missions for LCMS World Mission. Reverend Andrus was a blind man who was born sighted, but he lost his sight at age 11. And he used his blindness to bear witness to the glory of God in many different contexts. He said to us, just as in this gospel reading, and he preached on this text from John 9 that day, just as in this gospel reading, I am blind not because of sin, but to the glory of God. He said, 31 years after losing my sight, I can honestly and joyfully affirm how God has used my blindness for his glory and even my own good. Through my synodical work with the blind, I have the privilege of reaching, touching, and talking to many blind people and by God's grace to help them see the hand of God in the middle of their darkness. That probably would never have happened if I had been fully sighted. He had quite a sense of humor, too, and he went on to say, Blindness has always been even a blessing to me. I can walk past a glass jar of cookies and not even be tempted. I don't have to hassle with traffic, thanks to those of you who are my chauffeurs. Nor am I even in fear, for I'm not even aware when the near miss happens. I will not even get into clothing, television, magazines, and other temptations that through sight lure and entice people to sin. 
The third point, Jesus used spit and clay to restore the man's sight. You might think that's kind of strange, even yucky, to think of doing that. Spitting on the ground and making a mud out of that and applying it to the man's eyes. Why would Jesus have chosen that vehicle of all things? But think of it this way. To a blind person, it's probably very simple. Jesus was getting up close and personal. He was talking to him. He was touching him. He was personal with him. And he made it abundantly clear to this man that that message was for him. And that that washing in the pool was much more than just a physical washing, but it was a washing away of his spiritual blindness. And so Jesus gave the man both a physical and a spiritual healing that day. And he wanted that man to know it in a way that the blind man could grasp it and understand it. And so he used all the other senses to communicate this to him. When a blind person is standing in a crowd or at a distance from a person who is speaking to him or her, he or she isn't exactly sure if those words are for them. It's at a distance. They can't see it. But because of Jesus' up-close, personal presence, there was no doubt for this man that Jesus was there for him, that this message was for him, that this healing was for him. And then later, when Jesus sought after the man, the man recalled Jesus' sound, the sound of his voice, even his touch, likely his smell. He knew that this was the very same man, that this was the Messiah who had restored his sight. Each and every one of us needs and wants the message of God's love in a way we can grasp it, in a way we can understand it. And I think in part that's one of the reasons why God ordained the office of the holy ministry. So that you could hear from a living, breathing, touching, and touchable human being the eternal word of God. And I also think that's why God chose to attach this living word to ordinary elements of water and bread and wine, tangible things, to bring us his message of grace and forgiveness because God knows that we are sensory people. And that's why we proclaim in word and sacrament and in Christian music and liturgical art, the message. We are sensory people. Finally, the fourth insight. Jesus told the man to go wash in the pool of Siloam, that word that means sent. Incidentally, the word apostle means one who is sent out, sent on a mission. John frequently refers to Jesus in his gospel as the one sent by the Father, And in the same way, after washing us, after opening our eyes, after restoring us from spiritual blindness, now Jesus sends us out to tell others the good news. We aren't responsible for people's faith. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the result of Jesus miraculously giving something that wasn't there before. In our text The gift of sight comes not from deep down in the man, but the gift of sight comes from the giver. Jesus was sent by the Father for this purpose, even as he sends us out. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And we plant the seed, and we share the good news. That Jesus has saved us from sin and darkness and death 
and the devil by bringing us out of the darkness into his marvelous light and life and forgiveness. And those who see him through the eyes of faith and confess him with their lips and lives are those who have been brought into sight from blindness. But those who oppose him, like the Pharisees, are blinded further, leading to judgment. Sadly, that was the case with the Pharisees, and for that matter, anyone else who trusts in his or her own personal righteousness. But God saw through it all. He sees. He saw our sin. He knew its consequences, eternal death and separation from him in what the Bible calls the outer darkness. God sees. He sent his son, Jesus, true God and true man, into this world of darkness and sin and blindness to bring life and light and sight. God sees. Humanity's blind sin saw Jesus led all the way to the cross of Calvary. And in Good Friday's darkness, Jesus paid the price for our sin that we might be brought into the light. God sees. The sun's dawn on Easter Day sees shining angels announce that Jesus is alive and well and victorious over the darkness and that because he lives, we also will live. Life and light are his and life and light are ours. So now our sight restored, what do we do with it? We do exactly what the blind man in our text did. We believe and we worship. And that's why you're here today. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.